see you here. Thanks very much, Professor, and thanks very much to the uh, Minnesota International Center. It's certainly a pleasure to be here, to be really close to home uh, in Eau Claire, Wisconsin, and to be close to uh, Carleton as well. Um, thank you very much again. Um, I'm gonna talk about that video in a minute, um, but before I do, I wanna start with a quick story. Uh, about a year ago, I was in New York City visiting a close friend of mine. Is, it, is the sound coming through okay? Am I vibrating? Okay. Um, a year ago, I was visiting a close friend from college in New York City. Uh, his name's Colin. I was sleeping on his couch, and I woke up on a Saturday morning and saw Colin sitting at his kitchen table. And he's pounding away in his laptop and just said to me, uh, hey, sorry, I've just got to do a little work this morning. I thought, okay, no problem. A little later, he puts on a headset for a video conference. And I said, you know, wow, a video conference on a Saturday morning, that's pretty intense. And Colin said, yeah, I'm just tutoring this high school kid in China. Uh, he sent me his first essay, and we're going through his comments. So the video conference starts, and Colin's giving the student notes, telling him how to structure an opening paragraph, what a thesis statement looks like, and how to support it with evidence. And I keep listening, and Colin's getting a little animated and excited. He's talking about Locke and Rousseau, the underpinnings of American democracy. At the end of the call, Colin wraps it up and says, uh, hey, you know, for your first essay, that was a pretty good job. Uh, call or email if you have any questions. And I was kind of taken aback. Here I am lying on his living room sofa, and Colin is face to face teaching a student in China about the underpinnings of democracy. And Colin hangs up, and without a second thought, he looks over at me and says, okay, work's over. What do you want for breakfast? And that interaction said more to me about technology's role in global relations than any magazine article or TED talk I'd ever heard. For Colin and that student, the ability to connect to people around the world for free online is second nature. As someone who works for Google, it's a little embarrassing to say how awe-inspiring that moment was for me. Uh, but for anyone a few years younger, those interactions are just expected. They've been able to connect to people online their whole lives. For them, there isn't a pre-internet age and a post-internet age. There's just the internet and there's history. There isn't new media and old media, there's just what's online. And for them, borders and distance don't determine with whom you can connect. There's just those are connect who's, pardon me, those who are connected and those who aren't. Every day there's a new app that creates a new way of finding a date, learning a language, making a business deal, starting a conversation. And this technology is available to more people than ever before. Let's see, here we go. So in 2000, there were about 300 million people who were connected to the internet. Obviously that was 14 years ago, but today we're up to 2.7 billion. And not only does it reach two and a half billion people, it connects them all to each other. And just for some perspective here too, there are twice as many people online in China today as there were across the entire internet in the year 2000. So as a result, there are now hundreds of millions of media outlets, if you count everyone's social media page as an outlet, and I think we must. And that's just people, let's talk about the content here. The scale of information is pretty incredible. Just on YouTube, there are more than 100 hours of video uploaded every single minute. And the numbers across other platforms are pretty staggering. So in a bit, we'll talk about some of the implications of that connection for freedom and power for people around the world. But let's talk about how we got here. So around a year ago, sorry, more personal stories. Around a year ago, I was going through an old magazine that I'd, that I'd saved from when I was a kid. And out fell one of those AOL CD-ROMs. You guys remember those? They came in the mail. They fell out of magazines. And if you signed up for AOL, you turned on your dial-up modem. You heard that kind of funky noise, and then you heard the famous, you've got mail message. But AOL wasn't the same as the internet. It was a closed network that controlled what information was shared and received. At its height in 2002, it had about 27 million subscribers, and AOL had, AOL had a business model that had monthly fees, partnership with content providers, advertisers, games, uh, and so on. And AOL wasn't alone. It had competitors you might remember like CompuServe and Prodigy. But those services were just reaching their peak in popularity when the internet itself started to take off. Unlike the paid services, the internet was free and open. No one controlled the content, and the internet by design let anyone build new services and new features on top of the network. And that's exactly what happened. The New York Times plugged in, the University of Minnesota plugged in, the Vatican plugged in, the Tokyo Museum, the New York Stock Exchange, Amazon, Twitter, and so on. They all plugged in and they all connected to each other. The closed networks like AOL started to falter, 
And simply put, the internet grew to become the most powerful communications tool in history. And it did so because of its elegant stru structure. Unlike the other networks, it was free and open. Now, this is certainly an entertainment revolution, but let's think about what's changed. Amateur rock stars post homemade music videos on YouTube. Suddenly, they're on world tours. Bloggers hold politicians accountable. Individuals spark fundraising drives about things they're passionate about with millions of peeper, people pitching in. Think the ice bucket challenge. At the end of the day, no one is sitting in a corporate boardroom, at a movie studio, or in a government building deciding what's cool. What's hot, what's important, or who should become famous are decided by the people themselves, by what they're interested in. Ideas rise to the top or crash to the bottom because what people decide is important, and that's a major shift in power in what we're talking about today. So in the opening video, you may have seen a clip of this girl. Uh, her name's Martha Payne. She's a nine-year-old Scottish girl who protested, protested the quality of her school lunch by posting pictures on her blog. She thought that she deserved something a little bit healthier. So, and parents and others started sharing the blog around town. So pretty soon, the town council, which oversees the schools, got too overwhelmed by all these complaints about the beige school lunch. So what do they do? The council banned Martha from taking pictures of her lunch. And she mentioned the photo ban on her blog, and that's when her movement caught fire. Celebrity chef Jamie Oliver got involved. Her effort got global headlines, and the city council eventually reversed its ban. So today, Martha is an advocate for youth nutrition. and She's fighting poverty around the world. That's almost impossible to have occurred without the internet. But on the other side of the globe, we witnessed the all too common one step forward, two step back. So this is Bassem Youssef. He's a cardiac surgeon from Egypt. Bassem saw Jon Stewart on The Daily Show and decided that he wanted to make a satirical news show of his own. So just, just after Hosni Bumbarak was deposed, he saw his opportunity. He grabbed a video camera, started producing a show in his living room, and posted the episodes on YouTube. He called it the B-plus show. Now, the show started with just a few viewers, but in Egypt, Egyptians, pardon me, wanted comedy. They wanted the satire. Soon, he had 10,000 views per episode, then 100,000, then a million. And pretty soon, it got picked up by a major broadcaster with audiences uh, even greater than Jon Stewart's. Last year, he was named Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People of the Year. Now, Bassam's satire didn't discriminate. In 2012, he was detained by the Morsi government for insulting the president, insulting Islam, and reporting false news. He was released and then fined. Now, after Morsi was deposed, he made a few comments about the new leader, General al-Sisi, and found a few of his shows pulled off the air from that side as well. Then this summer, after al-Sisi was formally elected president, he ended his show. The government had had enough. When the show went off the air, Yusuf said something that I thought was especially poignant. He said, fear sells, fear works, and when people are afraid, referring to the government, they will not accept logic, let alone satire. Now, he makes a point that isn't lost on any world leaders. We know that throughout history, methods of communication that were free and open weren't embraced by government, governments, monarchs, or the police. To the contrary, they were shut down, monitored, and put back in their bottles. So what about those governments today? the ones accustomed to sense, sending censors to stand over the printing presses and over the teleprompters. Well, they see how the internet is transferring power from giant institutions to the people. And if you're a dictator used to controlling traditional media, what does your worst nightmare look like? Probably a lot like this. So as a result, nations like Cuba and North Korea just block the internet wholesale. Many others turning to uh, filtering and censorship the most infamous is China, where a steady increase in censorship led Google to just stop offering a search engine in that country entirely. And then, of course, on the other side of the spectrum, there are some Western nations and others like the Philippines and Argentina, governments that have generally maintained a free and open internet. The rest of the world is somewhere in between, but almost a third of all internet users face pervasive censorship of their online content. Now, at Google, our services like Gmail and YouTube have been blocked in at least 32 countries. Here's the list. Here's the list. 
I like to call this Google Censorship Hall of Fame. And we've got a link at the bottom to our transparency report. And from there, in real time, you can see all of the countries where Google's being blocked at any given moment. Um, ultimately, these countries are racing around, sticking their fingers in dams, constantly chasing down sites and tracking users. Forget the light bulb, just how many governments does it take to unscrew every internet user with a cell phone? The answer is far too many for any government to want to deal with. So blocking and censorship are what I call censorship 1.0. It's still effective in certain ways, but governments are getting more savvy. They're turning to censorship 2.0. Censorship 2.0 is much more subtle. It's doing things like passing laws that criminalize certain types of political, religious, and social speech. And I'm just recovering from a cold, so I apologize for the frequent drinks of water. So in 2012, Russian President Putin signed legislation establishing a nationwide register of banned websites declared harmful to Russia's youth. Pretty vague criteria. And big surprise, the regime found that many of its political opponents were also harmful to youth. No judicial oversight, just a list of websites the government officials are free to curate as they please. And an increasing number of countries are holding internet middlemen responsible for the, the uh, information that's posted on those sites. So for example, they're holding a newspaper site responsible for the comments that users are making on that site. And they're holding YouTube responsible for the videos that they find problematic. Um, so if you're a small news website and you're liable for a reader's comments, what do you do? You just don't offer the service to let users leave comments. It stifles the discussion entirely and accomplishes the goal for the government. Now, in Brazil, one of Google's own executives was detained because we failed to remove a video that the government found problematic. Or, pardon me, it was, a, it was criticizing an elected official. Now, some governments are increasingly using physical violence against people who post critical content online. The Committee to Protect Journalists, an outstanding organization, uh, reports that half of all journalists imprisoned around the world today operate primarily online. And that makes sense because they typically don't have the institutions behind them that can help offering the legal support and other support that a traditional journalist may receive. And in fact, Turkey, a country that detains more journalists than China and Iran, just passed a law last week that gives the government new powers to block websites. Now, report after report shows that in the fight for freedom and openness online, citizens and the internet are losing. So why should we pay attention here? Now, in the US, information on the internet is about as open as accessible as anywhere. But here are two reasons to pay attention. First, an open internet is a fundamental human right. Um, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights says that everyone has the right to freedom of opinion and expression. This right includes freedom to hold opinions without interference and to seek, receive, and impart information ideas through any media, regardless of frontiers. Now, this is a document that was crafted in the 1940s, but its words hold true today. Now, people want, in fact, they demand to access information and communicate. Uh, if we care about human rights, this is an issue we certainly need to watch. Now, second, a free and open internet is really good for human well-being. When, when the open internet is restricted, so is the prosperity and the potential of the people who are connected to it. So the web has made it easier for business, both large and small, to reach new customers, communicate with clients, run back office operations, do payroll, marketing, you name it. In fact, the long-term economic impact for society may be one of the greatest imperatives for a free and open internet. Estonia was recently ranked number one in internet freedom worldwide. And its freedoms are accompanied by the highest GDP per person of any former Soviet bloc nation. By 2016, the internet is expected to contribute $4.2 trillion of economic value to the G20 countries. And it's about 21% of GDP growth overall. So from a business perspective, the internet's critical. Now, a nation that doesn't have a free and open internet is an economy that, if it hasn't been left behind, it will soon. Now, of course, for Google, full transparency, we obviously have uh, an imperative for an open internet. It's really good for business. The more open and accessible the internet is, the more people who choose to uh, access it, the more people who use our products. It's that simple. Making sure that people can access and use the internet safely and securely happens to be directly aligned with our business interests. But it isn't just about internet nerds like us. 
for all Americans and others who value connecting to people around the world, this is a critical geopolitical issue. When governments filter and restrict the internet, we lose the opportunity to connect to people as much as they lose the opportunity to connect to us. So if we agree that a free and open internet is a foundation for a greater future, then it becomes pretty clear who has to fight for it. As individuals, we have a responsibility to take action, to speak up when our governments or others encroach on the internet as we know it. There are some immediate tactics we can take uh, to turn the tides more towards openness. But most importantly, we need to make sure that the US government is a role model for internet freedom. Uh, the revelations about US surveillance online uh, has certainly eroded our moral high ground on this issue, and we need to fight for that back. A couple of things that we can do. First, we should demand that governments be transparent about how they restrict information and monitor citizens. So all governments that request information about people from technology companies should allow those companies to make that information public. And that's not the case universally. Even better, they should publish their own reports about how much data they're demanding from companies and collecting themselves about their citizens. Second, we need to make sure that governments apply the same rule of law online that they apply offline. So for example, in the US, police need a search warrant to come into your home and open the mail that's on your table. They don't need a search warrant to search your email. That needs to change. And third, international trade agreements have to be modernized to treat the flow of information just like we treat the flow of steel, grain, and automobiles. This means that restrictions on the internet should be treated the same way we treat unfair tariffs. Governments should be held accountable from all sides. There's one simple reality that these governments don't get. The power of the internet comes from its openness. You can't change the fundamental free and open nature and still call it the internet. There's the web that's open or something else that's concocted by a group of government officials. And this is not an issue to only protect today's internet users, but this is about the four and a half billion people who have yet to come online. So as mobile technology keeps getting less expensive and more available, those billions will connect. The question is to what internet will they find? Will it be a network that helps everyone connect on Earth? Or a network that reminds us of a different time, a time when the world was divided between free nations and those behind the Iron Curtain? This time it could look much more like the fiber curtain. The future can't be about an internet that's filtered, censored, or fragmented. One that takes power from internet users and transfers it back to bureaucrats and dictators. It must be an internet where Basim Yusuf can upload a video that inspires millions. One where an entrepreneur in Northfield can connect to customers in India and Brazil. And one where a U of M student can tutor kids in Burma, Iran, and Cuba. And it must be an internet that empowers all of us to be truly global citizens. The freedom and openness of the internet is under serious threat. But if we stay attuned to the threats, if we demand that the US lead by example, we can ensure that the internet today will be empowering, pardon me, we can ensure that the internet will be empowering for the next generation as it is for us today. Looking forward to your thoughts and comments and continue the conversation. Thanks so much. So I'm sure you have lots of questions, but I have some, and I get to start. Um, and the first question that I, I wanted to raise with Ben is something that um, he and I talked about very briefly, but which has been a big issue for me in the research that I've been doing. He was concentrating, I think, on in his presentation on countries that we think of as um, autocratic, third world, whatever the phrase you want to use. but. I personally think that one of the biggest threats to freedom of expression on the internet right now is coming from the European Union. And there was a ruling back in May involving Google Spain, and it led to a recognition of something called the right to be forgotten. And I don't know how many of you have heard of this concept. Uh, probably a number of you have, some of you probably haven't. Essentially, what it's based on is this idea that after a certain period of time or after someone's circumstances change, they should have the right to have information about them basically made unfindable. What the US Supreme Court in a very different case about 25 years ago called should be made practically obscure. And what this meant is for Google 
that they've now been put under pressure to remove from their search results links to stories if individuals are able to make the case that I think the word they used was if the information is no longer relevant. It's irrelevant. It's irrelevant. Um, irrelevant, uh, no longer relevant or excessive for what it was originally collected. The British House of Lords issued a report this past summer that called this concept misguided in principle and unworkable in practice. But in fact, they've gotten requests, Google has gotten requests to take down about 457,000 links to material, including that published by news organizations such as the BBC, The Guardian, The Times of London, The Telegraph, and others. Some of those Google has restored, but some of them have remained taken down. So I wanted to ask Ben to talk a little bit about the right to be forgotten. Well, thanks so much again. And I apologize for the hoarse voice one more time. Um, so the, you know, the right to be forgotten comes from a very sincere place for many citizens in Europe. The idea that the web has made accessible information that if it was published in a newspaper would largely go into the recycling bin the next day and never be seen again. Um, but in the age of the web, this information lives in perpetuity. And I think for many of us, myself included, the idea that something, some misguided deed a while ago, uh, the fact that people can find that um, is somewhat alarming. So I think that the idea comes from a, a, a pretty sincere place. Um, in operation, the court ruling is, is very problematic. Um, it pretty much says that companies are data controllers, that information that's published about you is your personal data and that we are responsible for receiving these, these demands. Um, and it was the Europe's highest court, so there's really no appeal process for us. Um, but we're trying to find a workable way to both respect the public's right to know and the right that this court has found this information be removed. Um, so we've started a web form where European users can send us the link. Um, it's reviewed by a new massive legal team, which we now have to review these types of requests. Um, and then we can either push back on the, the legal request, uh, or pardon me, fulfill it after um, we've determined that it's within this ruling, um, or ask for more information to try and clarify. Um, but we've received requests from teachers who receive bad reviews from their students, and they don't want those on the internet anymore. Um, from general contractors who get bad reviews and decide that those should no longer be found on the web. We've, we're particularly concerned about politicians and political political candidates who are trying to do scrubs of their search results um, before they run for office, those types of things. But there are a lot of very challenging moral dilemmas to balance here, uh, the public's rights to know versus the, the right to be forgotten. Um, and we've put together an outside committee to help us uh, work through some of these. Because one of the major um, new aspects of this ruling was the fact that companies are the ones who need to make this decision. It's not governments. And that to me is really alarming that, that companies are the, the first barrier here. Um, it's not the courts. And if, for example, if Google um, makes a decision that the individual who made the complaint doesn't like, they have a data protection authority, a government body, they can take that to to complain. And th then that authority can then sue Google or demand that we remove this. For the news publisher, for the person who put that up, there is no equivalent uh, means of recourse. So we're trying to be as transparent as we can alerting these uh, websites when their content has been removed. And now for every named search, so if you're searching for someone's name in Europe, you're gonna see a warning underneath your search results saying, under this law, something may have been removed. So that you just have some sense that this is, this is, uh, this is happening. Um, may I say one more point on that? Yes. The, the, the key thing that I'm concerned about here is how this is gonna migrate. Because we know that governments love to take uh, well-intentioned laws and then apply them in ways that are somewhat more malicious. So again, in Russia, we've seen a right to be forgotten proposed, a number of other places as well that don't have the same types of legal systems in place and due process to, to get through this. Um, and when Europe or the United States makes moves this direction, it just removes all credibility as we try to advocate for internet freedom globally. When we're telling President Putin to stop censoring your search results or stop removing links, he can say, well, look at Europe. They're doing the exact same thing. And the moral high ground there is lost. I just wanted to add very quickly that lest you think that this couldn't happen here in the United States, um, the state of California passed 
a similar but not identical provision. Um, it only applies to people under the age of 18, or rather the content that they posted when they were 18 or younger. Uh, but they have a right to what's called a right to erasure. And that is actually going to the site itself that hosts the content, which is different mm -hmm. from the Google Spain decision, which has, has been said, deals with links. I mean, technically, as it exists today, if you know that a story you want to see is on the Telegraph's website, you can still go to the Telegraph's website and find the story. So the Telegraph isn't required to remove the story. What you're not going to get is the search result that would lead you to that if you didn't already know that. The California law takes it to this next step and would allow the removal of this material. It's not yet become effective. I believe it becomes effective in January of next year. But it is the first you know, bit of the camel's nose under the tent in this country to try to do something similar. I personally think that it raises serious constitutional issues. We'll have to wait and see. OK, my second question. I know that one of the things that is of great concern to Google um, is the whole issue of email privacy. Um, obviously, many of us use Gmail in one form or another, so we're all very aware of the impact of uh, NSA and other forms of surveillance on our ability to communicate freely. And you've been very active um, seeking reform to the uh, Electronic Communication Privacy Act, the USA Freedom Act, and similar legislation that's in, in, intended to try to get the NSA, I guess I would say, back in check. So I wondered if you could talk about the, that for a minute, and as you respond to that, talk a little bit about encryption in the context of both websites and email communication. Sure. So I'll take it from the perspective of an international company, um, aside from my personal outrage about the idea of governments spying on me directly. Um, but from this perspective of Google, we're an international company that has users from around the world. And the NSA spying revelations that were revealed by Edward Snowden basically demonstrated that the US has legal provisions that allow them to demand information of companies pretty much however they like to, especially if they're about people internationally. Um, that's really problematic when you're trying to operate an email service that serves more people outside the US than it does people inside the US. And our trust as a service decreases precipitously. Um, I can only imagine if there were a French company or, God forbid, a Chinese company that operated an email service here and that we found out that that information was very susceptible to intercept from the opposing government. I can imagine that we would be outraged by that. Um, and as you can imagine, people around the, the world have been outraged at those types of revelations. Um, so, I mean, we've generally, user trust is really important to the services we operate and we've been pushing for more reforms on the way law enforcement and others can access that type of information. Um, as I mentioned before, with, with emails, uh, um, authorities don't need a warrant to search, to, to come to us and ask for information in your email. Um, we have interpreted that under the Fourth Amendment, they need to give us a warrant, so we're able to push back. But not every uh, internet service may feel they have the same leverage that we do um, to give that same type of pushback. So reform to the Electronic Communications Privacy Act is really important. Um, what's even more important is that we establish some very concrete safeguard and oversight over uh, intelligence style surveillance um, to make sure that we're allowed to be transparent. We would love to be able to say how many requests we get from the, the government um, for people's Gmail information, those types of things. And there are pretty strict laws around that that don't let us do that. Um, we think that companies should be able to be transparent on that front. Can you talk just a second, and I don't, if this is not within your expertise, I, that's perfectly fine, but about the idea of SSL encryption by sure. default and, and, and the end-to-end -end project? It, sure, um, so you're right, I'm not, a, I'm not an engineer, so that's not perfectly within my, my uh, expertise. Um, but one of the NSA revelations was the fact that the NSA was tapping into Google's data centers between, as communication was in transit between the data centers. So for a long time we've allowed encryption for users who are sending messages between them but we did not realize that, that they had the capabilities to tap between our uh, data centers. So a few weeks after that was revealed, all information that's traveling within Google is now encrypted. Um, and it, it's very essential that people are using services that have that type of encryption to make sure that no one, whether it's the government or other malicious actors, are in the middle intercepting those types of communications. Um, there was a time when we said, um, 
encryption was optional, or if you use Gmail, you could choose to encrypt it or you could choose not to. If it's not encrypted, it might move a little faster. Um, it might work better with slower machines. Um, but after some of those revelations, we basically said it's uh, encryption or nothing using Gmail. So in regards to the specific project, I don't know the specific details, but encryption is definitely a priority. And for internet users, they should make sure that their information is being encrypted both with data storage sites and with their day-to-day uh, -day communications online. And as I understand it, one of the things that Google will be reporting in its transparency report, which Ben was talking about before, is which companies support email encryption and which ones don't. Yeah, so we do that now. We, we can see which companies are doing that because we can show you um, the percentage of outgoing emails from Gmail that are encrypted on the other end. So if you're sending an email between two Gmail users, you know that that's encrypted. But if you're using other services, it may not be encrypted on that back end. Um, so we want to make sure we're calling that out. Okay, I have two more questions, and then I will open it up. And this is, I suppose, in a way, sort of the elephant in the room, but I think it is something that you know, we need to address, and I'd love to hear what you have to say about it. We've been concentrating here on the um, effects of government surveillance, government uh, snooping. But a lot of people are very worried about what is referred to as big data and the idea that a lot of private companies are collecting a lot of information about us, who we communicate with, what websites we visit, what products we buy, and so forth. And one of those companies is Google. Yeah. So I think uh, when the White House uh, commissioned a report which was headed up, I think, by John Podesta, uh, one of the things, the companies they looked at was Google, as well as Facebook and data brokers and many others. I don't mean to single out Google exclusively. But I think people are concerned, I talked to my students about this, about the collection of their data by private actors, because as troubling as government collection is, we'd like to think that it's at least subject to things like constitutional protections, Fourth Amendment, things like that. Google as a private actor doesn't have those kinds of constraints and is only going to either be uh, controlled by legislation, by court rulings, or by regulation or self-regulation. And I just want to mention kind of three things, and uh, I'm sure there are other things we could talk about. Street View is one example of a um, product, I guess for lack of a better term, which many of us have utilized when we're using Google Maps and things like that. From an American legal standpoint, and this is something that you know, I've been working in for many years, the idea that you can take a photograph of something that's on a public street is so clearly established in American law that it was hard to imagine that Street View could run afoul of the law. Nevertheless, Street View has had to uh, convince the attorneys generals in about 40 states that what they're doing uh, does comply with the law. So that's one point. Um, Google Apps for Education, it came out earlier this year that um, email was being uh, scanned by Google for the purpose, for advertising purposes. Google's now said it's going to conclude that practice. And then finally, the hot new issue of wearables like Google Glass and the question of how safe your personal information is. Google has advertised that Google Glass was designed with privacy in mind. I think some of us are a little skeptical. So I wondered if you could talk about those three things wow, quickly. Okay. Um, you're going to have to remind me down the list as we go. We That's go all right. Street View. Okay. <laughs> Google so Apps for Education <laughs> <laughs> and wearables. Okay. So I'll say generally that obviously these concerns are really important for any internet user to think about who has their data, how it's being used, and, and those types of things. Um, you know, for us as a company to offer an email service, inevitably you're entrusting your private communications with a corporate entity, and we have to store it. And the only way that you can have your email on your cell phone, on your laptop, and on your tablet simultaneously whenever you want it, is it has to live somewhere to be transmitted to those different devices. And right now, that's our data centers. Um, so you know, from, from that standpoint, and as well, the, the fact, too, that we're an advertising business. You know, we offer com services that are generally completely free, and our business is based on the advertising you see in search results. It's based on the advertising you see in Gmail. Um, and the key, the key thing there is that users need to have choice in how these things operate. And they need to understand uh, you know, what's being collected and how. So I think companies have a responsibility to make sure that users understand what's being collected and what control they have over it. 
So if, if you're interested from Google's perspective on what data we have, you can go to google.com slash dashboard. And if you're logged into Google, if you use Gmail, you can see exactly what information we have about you. How many email messages, how many calendar invites, how many contacts that are stored, um, your advertising preferences, so in Google Chrome and other things. We try and serve ads that are relevant to you. So if you're in Gmail and you're talking about a trip that you're taking we, to Minneapolis, for example, one of the ads might be a rental car in Minneapolis that could, be, that could be valuable. And that's how companies stay competitive and are able to offer these free services is by offering good advertising. Now, you can go into your dashboard and you can disable interest-based advertising if you don't like it. You'll still get ads. It'll be based on other things, but it won't be based on your browsing history or your interests. Um, if you don't, you know, and if the fact is, it, as well, is that if you just want to export all that data and upload it to a different service, you can do that. They'll download in spreadsheets that are compatible with Yahoo and Microsoft and other, other products. So choice is really important, and users do have a choice if they want to use Google or if they don't want to use Google. Um, the government side of it is scarier because if the government blocks a website or demands your data, you don't have a choice about that. You don't have that, and it's also universal. Um, you know, if Google chooses to take a piece of content down or something, that's, that's, that's just on our service. So regarding Street View specifically, um, within the, Street View is certainly within the law in the way it, it operates, just taking photos. Um, we do take privacy steps in that if it, a person is captured on Google Street View, their face is blurred automatically. Um, so you should not be able to recognize individuals because well, at least you're not able to recognize their faces. Same goes for license plates. Um, and if you want, you can make requests to Google to have houses and other things blocked, blocked as well, or just blurred out. Um, so it's a valuable service that, that people enjoy, but there, are, there need to be those types of protections in place, because I can guarantee you that regardless of the constitutional protection, if, it gets to the, if, if a service like that is something the public does not like and the Congress does not like, they will find ways to regulate it. Um, and that's something that we're certainly very considerate about. And, and certainly in Europe, they were much more proactive on trying to regulate Street View. But again, it's a different constitutional structure. And we'll just We've got a couple more I've got to hit too, right? Well, very quickly, because I do want to move on, uh, which is this uh, the issue of Google Apps for Education oh, sure. and scanning the email for advertising purposes. Yep. Something that those of us that have uh, umn.edu email feel very strongly about since it's a Gmail program now. Yep. Um, so there is definitely a very visceral reaction to the idea of having things scanned and advertising served up against it in many instances. Um, the key thing to note there is that Google will scan your emails, but they do it for, we do it for very, um, you know, reasons beyond advertising. So the same algorithm that looks at your email for ads is also the same one that identifies spam, the same one that identifies potentially malicious content that we can warn you about beforehand. Um, it's, it's the same tool. The question is whether or not we use that information to make money, to serve ads. And there was certainly a lot of pushback about that for, for apps for EDU. Um, and we, we changed the, the policy for that. Um, and I think the question about kids and students as well is something that's really coming up and that all tech companies need to think a lot about. And we're, we're thinking about ways of developing tools to make sure that if the public does not want ads in front of kids, to, to, to eliminate that as much as possible. The last thing I asked you about was wearables, but I think I'll save that and let others ask it if they're sure. interested. In it. I have one more question, and then we will open it up, because I think I have to ask this. Because with what Congress is doing and expected to do in the not too distant future, and certainly the FCC with net neutrality, yeah. I think a lot of people are interested in knowing what Google's position is on net neutrality. Last time around, Google was right in the forefront on this issue, arguing for net neutrality. Um, and it came a little later to the party this time, but I guess about a week ago, uh, issued a statement basically saying that no internet access provider should block or degrade internet traffic, nor should they sell fast lanes that prioritize particular internet services over others. Any comment sure. beyond that? So just for context, the idea of net neutrality is the idea that an internet service provider should not be able to slow down or speed up certain content based on their own business interests or other interests. So if, for example, Netflix cuts a deal with Comcast and says, hey, we'll pay you more, allocate us more of your bandwidth of your service, um, 
that would mean that things like YouTube and Hulu might be slower and Netflix gets an unfair advantage on, on that front. So obviously as an internet company who doesn't own many wires, we just are services that operate on top of those, uh, we certainly don't want um, private companies or the, the, last, you know, the last company that um, manages your traffic before you see it to be able to make those types of, those types of distinctions. Um, right now at the FCC, they've got a number of regulatory proposals of how best to address this. How do we keep net neutrality in place? How do we keep it open to make sure that there aren't these decision makers doing that? And they've proposed a couple of uh, regulatory ways of doing this, um, allocating internet infrastructure the same way we do other critical infrastructure like power lines. Um, I don't have the expertise as to specifically, you know, whether those are good solutions or not, not good solutions. But the general principle is that, that co companies nor governments should be able to decide what content you see. You should be able to decide. And they shouldn't be able to determine whether something gets to you much slower or much faster than something else. But it, it is a difficult question because we're dealing at this point with you know, private enterprise that's not regulated like a utility. It's not designated a common carrier. So the ability of government to step in and regulate this is you know, questionable. Let's just mm -hmm. put it that way. OK, those are my questions. And now it's time for your questions. So and we have <coughs> two people with mics. Yes, we have two microphones. You can raise your hand. And we just ask you to keep your questions brief so we can continue the conversation. Hi. My name is Hussein al Hajj. I'm a captain in the Internal Security Forces in Lebanon. My question is, what is your approach for the freedom, for the conflict between the freedom of the internet and the use of the internet for the criminal objective? My second question is, how you can describe the cooperation between Google and the security agency all over the world? My third question is, what is the procedure that uh, Google do to avoid using it and committing crime. Thank you. Okay. Certainly. So I'll start with the relationship between um, Google and intelligence agencies around the world. So if a foreign government decides that they want information about a Google user, what we do is we say, use the mutual legal assistance treaties that the US government has established with your countries. So instead of us taking the information, we say, you must go through the US legal system have US uh, attorneys at the Department of Justice assess your legal request as a, it's a system that's been established for decades um, for law enforcement in one country to get information from another country. Um, and then if the US Department of Justice sees this as a legitimate request for information, then we will receive the legal process from the DOJ to assist that, that country. And this is important because there are a lot of, um, you know, there are criminal cases around the world where those law enforcement officials could benefit from the communications that are passed across our networks. But it's for the US government to decide to, to take these requests and process them uh, before we give over this type of information. Um, sorry, the next, the, qu the first question was about, sorry. Oh, criminal content, that yeah. type of thing, okay. Um, so criminal content on the, the internet. So we, we operate specific services like YouTube uh, blogger, Google search, those types of things. And we, are, we have the, the opportunity to create rules around our specific services. So for example, on YouTube, there are a number of things that are constitutionally protected speech, but we've decided that we don't want that to be on YouTube. Um, bomb making is a good example. That's something that's protected by the Constitution. You can go to the library and get information on how to make bombs, but we don't want that to be part of the YouTube community, so we choose not to do that. And we have explicit policies against other types of criminal behavior, whether it's um, encouraging terrorism, obviously a very topical issue right now with the videos that ISIS is trying to disseminate. They're trying to use YouTube to do that. Um, but we don't, we have specific rules and there are laws against disseminating uh, terrorist uh, content. So we, we're able to, to mediate these types of rules and have teams that review uh, flagged content, things that people s say is breaking the law or is breaking our policies and we can uh, remove that and, and take action. I mean, I think there, is, there are definitely questions about the internet writ large. How do we stop illegal activity from happening? Um, that's a much more complex question, whether you know, it's terrorist financing or illegal activity financing that's happening. I think there are ways for us to follow the money and figure out where that's originating from and ending and to chase that, that down. Um, I think solutions 
that are blanket censorship and uh, blanket removal of information, blanket rules that stop people from sharing and receiving information is very problematic for the internet structure and keeping things open moving forward. But I, I think the tricky part for Google is, because it has such an international presence, is that criminal laws in different countries are very different from the U.S. criminal structure. Mm -hmm. Speech that would be absolutely protected here can be criminal in another country. And I'm not talking about building bombs. I'm talking about, for example, uh, insult laws that exist in, in many countries, okay. or the Les Majesty law in Thailand, for yep. example. Yeah, that's a great point. And part of this too, we on that same transparency report I mentioned earlier, we have we list out all of the government requests we receive globally and the percentage of which are complied with. So you can see by country um, what requests we're getting uh, and what we're complying with and what they were for. The number one category is defamation because in so many places around the world, that's um, uh, it, it's written in law that that's something that's that's illegal. So our we have a couple of approaches around jurisdiction for those types of things, if we're talking about the removal of content. Mm -hmm. um, we have specific domains that are just for given countries. So if, for example, um, Thailand is a great example, where they have laws against uh, defamation towards the king. So we have a YouTube that's specific, specifically dedicated to Thailand. And if they serve us valid legal process um, that cites a law, uh, we will respond to that for a content takedown, but restricted only to the domain that's for Thai users. So that means if you go on YouTube Thailand, that video won't be there. If a Thai user chooses to change the settings at the bottom of their page and go to the worldwide version of YouTube, they'll still be able to access that information, but we're not gonna, we're, we're not gonna censor the entire internet, our entire service, um, based on the jurisdiction of one country's laws in which we don't operate. Hi, <clears throat> thank you. It's very evident that you love your job and you do it very, very well um, in explaining what you do at Google. Um, I want to refer to the transparency list, uh, specifically to Iran. Um, because my husband is from Iran, I have visited the country multiple times uh, for the reason to visit family. And um, the most recent time I have been there was last year. And uh, I was able uh, to use internet um, all the time I was there in 2013. And uh, currently I'm on Facebook all the time with family members uh, in 2014. So, and I know, uh, we know that the government, for sure, um, uses um, Twitter. Um, they make sure that we know that. So my question to you, is there something uh, that um, I am missing here? Why, why are they on that list? Uh, if, I, if I'm not the only one that has used it, and Iran is a huge country, um, what am I missing here that, that, that they're on your list? Yep. How often is that list updated? Right. Um, and I is there something I'm missing here? Because I personally have used that list um, for internet, for Facebook, et cetera. I'd just like to know how you, how, how you put them in, on that list, yep. um, just because I just interact with family. Thank you. So my apologies. I, w I may not have been clear about how that list, uh, what that list was exactly. So those are, those are countries that have blocked Google products at some point in time. So it may not currently be blocked. Um, in Iran specifically, I'm pretty sure YouTube is, is blocked. Our service isn't available there. Um, but you can go to the transparency report, and we've got a live list of where the blocks are occurring in different places. Um, you know, uh, YouTube in China. And those are just our products. So those aren't speaking to Twitter or to um, Facebook or other places. But one quick story about, about blocking. So it's worth noting that in Pakistan right now, all of YouTube is blocked there. And Pakistan is a, obviously a very large country. Um, the, the block is re in response to one specific video that insulted the prophet. And that led to an entire nationwide block. So for a service that has 100 hours of video uploaded every single minute, that one single video is now the excuse that's being used to block the entire service across the country. Um, and you see those types of things happening where they're more political decisions than they are practical decisions. 
Um, and there's a, very, there's a group of Pakistanis right now who are working very hard um, in the courts to try and get that block lifted, and I think they'll be successful. I hope so. Yes, in the front there, yes. Do you have a mic? Or Sorry, we have, there's one just in the side there, and we'll come to the oh, middle next. Okay. Go ahead, sir. Wait, 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 we have to have the mic, mic because we are recording. So we'll go with Brett first, and then we'll take you. So don't worry, we'll come back to you. Sorry, Brett, Sorry. I couldn't see you. Um, my question is, you mentioned the, the YouTube guidelines, or guidelines in, on Blogger or wherever. Um, what does community mean? For, for these these platforms, who decides what um, those those guidelines are? Um, what what goes into them, and you, what kind of um, is there a sense of moral duty, mm -hmm. uh, ethical duty that goes into them? How do you how do you construct those? Yep. Um, so these community guidelines, you can you can take a look at it. If you just do a search for YouTube community guidelines, you can see what types of speech we allow and don't allow on our platform. Um, so the definition of community is a really great question. I think it's just something, you know, it's, it's mostly about when people go to YouTube, what can they expect to see? Um, and very early on when YouTube was founded, you know, we, there was a block on pornography. You know, there's no pornography on YouTube. And that was a, just a very conscious decision that was made because we didn't want YouTube to be, be defined as just a pornography engine because that's pretty quickly what it would become if that was allowed. So, I mean, community is just generally what are you able to find here and what, what, um, what information are you able to share and receive? And from very early on, we've said that free speech is really critical and that any um, blocks that we impose have to be very well thought through for, for that very reason. So we use uh, the UN guiding principles on freedom of expression and speech. Um, we have a team of attorneys and other human rights experts who consider what, how we revise our policies. Um, a good example is that on YouTube, you are not allowed to um, directly uh, threaten violence against people based on certain characteristics. Um, race, ethnicity, uh, gender, um, sexual orientation, a number of different uh, specific provisions. And those are based on very well-established human rights guidelines that have come down um, from various organizations. Um, I mean, so just to kind of show you the, the, the nuance that we have to play here, um, on YouTube, you can post a video that says death to America and advocates, says, you know, down with America. What you can't do is you can't post a video that says death to Americans. You can't attack those individuals specifically because they're part of that protected group. But political speech is very nuanced and ending a country is legitimate political speech that happens. Um, and that's something we do a lot. But obviously these decisions are tough. Um, we don't pull down proactively. It's based on user flags. So if you see a video that you think violates our policies, you have to flag it down in the corner, and then it comes to us for review. But it's completely impossible for us to review those 100 hours that are uploaded every single minute. It has to be flagged. And we've got folks working around the clock uh, in regions all over the world who review these types of things. And those things that have been flagged that do violate our policies come down in a matter of minutes as opposed to hours or days. Thank you for the presentation. That was very. I think it's on. It is. It was really informative. I just wanted to uh, like thanks for the clarification that in Pakistan all the contents are not blocked, just YouTube. Because mm -hmm. as a as a citizen of Pakistan, what was communicated to me that the government requested uh, Google or YouTube to block that video, which was against profit because that was creating a lot of problems in our country. YouTube didn't agree to it and. In return, we didn't have any other option rather to block it. So my question was that, that list you shared of the countries. So actually, what message you wanted to give to us, to people who are from that country, so we can take it back and we can, like, we can talk to the people who are responsible for blocking and other things. So like, different people are there, these services are blocked in the countries. What message you want to give to us wow. that why the, it's a I didn't question. get it? And the second thing is that sitting in U.S. and deciding about, because Google is mainly here in U.S., deciding that what contents are okay for the countries and what not, how you take the decision that this should be allowed to be seen and mm -hmm. this should not be allowed to be seen in a particular country, right. which is going to affect. Yep. So we respond, thank you for the question, by the way. Um, we respond to, um, sorry, one step back. 
So I, I mentioned these guidelines that we put in place to start with on something like YouTube. Um, from there, we choose which countries that we operate in. And those, are, those choices are made based on business interests, based on practicality, based on our comfort with certain local laws. So we choose which areas to, to have a local version of YouTube. So we have it in some places. Pakistan is not a place that has its own local version of YouTube. So for us, if the Pakistani government comes to us and says, block this video, we don't have the capacity right now to block it just in Pakistan. We have to block it for our services globally or for people that encompass much more than, than Pakistan. Um, so our, our, our procedure essentially is setting down the base rules, what's allowed in our community guidelines. And from there, we'll accept valid legal process. So if a government somewhere where we operate tells us that something is against the law, then we will review that to make sure that it meets the spirit of the law that they've presented to us, and then we'll block it for that specific region. And that's just how our specific platform operates. Um, in terms of a specific message, um, uh, you know, I don't, I think it'd be paternalistic for me to, to give, you know, wisdom to Pakistanis about how the internet should be, should be viewed. I think it really has to be the individuals themselves and a larger conversation with the country to determine you know, what information stays up, what goes, what gets blocked, and what doesn't. I think the discussion that's happening in Pakistan right now is, is the cultural discussion that you know, I really shouldn't be a part of. It's something between the citizens and their government, and they'll, they'll make that ultimate decision. Take two more, two more questions here and then in the middle. Hi. Um, about a year and a half ago, I remember reading a couple articles about how the UK had passed a law that internet, I believe it was at internet service provider level, that pornography could be opted into or opted out. And that was a family decision that you as an internet user could set up your internet so that you could opt in or opt out of that service. And um, basically coming down to that it should be a family or an individual decision that there's a lot of things out there that you might not want to see, but it search results pop them up anyways. Um, even when you go to Fox News or whatever, they're always on the sidelines. And so in my mind, it seems like it would be for the public good to be able to have that choice, like you were talking about earlier, that we can set our preferences. Um, but there's a lot of talk about how that could never get passed in the United States due to our constitutional amendments and what people believe about free speech. And I was wondering if you could speak to that because if it's not a government censoring it and mm -hmm. if it's an individual choosing that they should or shouldn't do or do not want to see those things, why would it be considered censorship? Thanks. Sure. So the, the provision put in place by, uh, it was David Cameron's government, basically told um, UK citizens that if they want to see pornography and objectionable content, they have to notify their internet service provider. So say, raise their hand and say, hey, I would love to see pornography um, for them to be able to, to see that. Um, so I, you know, I don't have any problem personally with the idea of user choice. I think that's critical. If people don't want to see that, they shouldn't have to. But the way this was structured, this seemed to me to be a much more clear moral imperative to eliminate that from as, you know, almost a public health approach against pornography as opposed to really giving individuals the choice to, to say, no, I don't want to see this, or yes, I do. Um, I think at the, the end, if it's, if it's something that you've installed on your computer to uh, filter out certain types of things, I think that's, um, that's a personal choice that you can make. To have it be in the internet service provider level a few steps up, I think it's more problematic. Because if you're not inclined to raise your hand and say you'd like to see pornography, it's shown very clearly in this UK example that things about sexual health, about um, breast cancer, and about a no number of other things that filters do really poor jobs of distinguishing from pornography, that's also getting blocked out from users in the UK. Um, so for me personally, this, this isn't something that is, pertains to Google quite so much, but I think it's something where we should push for a system in which individuals are able to make that choice at the, as close to the individual as possible. And we should discourage our governments from making those moral judgments for us somewhere closer to the middle. Take the final question here. <coughs> Thank you. Um, I'd like to um, to hear your comment about child pornography, and if you think Google should be proactive about that um, wor worldwide problem, 
Do you think you have a social role in maybe taking part in prevention? Absolutely. Yeah, I think child sexual abuse imagery universally is regarded as, as something that's harmful. Um, in fact, in the US, there are very clear laws about that that prohibit us from disseminating or possessing that type of that, that information. Um, tech companies have partnered together to uh, create a hashing system, essentially. To, if there are known images of child sexual abuse, that there's a, a repository that's managed outside of the tech companies by the Center, National Center for Missing and Exploited Children um, to help uh, companies recognize when that's available in their search engine or their services and to block it as soon as possible. Um, there was a more controversial case recently where someone was passing a known image of child sexual abuse imagery via email and we as a company are mandated by law to notify um, when, um, we're in, when that comes across our networks. So we, we notified the government that this was being passed. Um, I think that's a very legitimate social conversation to ask if, that, if that's the way it should be. Um, but I think we're very committed as a company to stopping the dissemination of child sexual abuse imagery. And there really isn't anyone that I'm hearing in the free speech community that I work within um, who's saying that we should, we should change those types of practices.